Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So thank you so much. And it's very nice to see familiar faces again. I hope we can see each other in person soon. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about a, a paper that we just posted in the archive like two days ago. It's a very simple paper where we are uh, characterizing all gauge invariant functions with the goal of, um, of um, designing machine learning models that are expressive and easy to optimize and, and work with, with them. So the paper is called Scalers are Universal, Gauge Invariant Machine Learning, Structure Like Classical Physics. And my collaborators are David Hogg, Kayser Fisher, Wei Chi Yao, and Ben Bloom Smith at NYU. Um, so uh, as I said, the goal is to parameterize uh, functions that arise from physics that obey classical physical symmetries like rotation invariance or equivariance, parity and boost in any dimension. So basically I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm working with functions that take a collection of vectors in RD and give, for instance, a scalar R, uh, which is, uh, and the function is invariant, meaning that if I apply, if I act by an element of a group on my input vectors, then the function doesn't change. That's what I mean with invariant. And um, I also want to parameterize equivariant functions. So meaning that if I act on all the uh, inputs by some say rotation, then the output of the function rotates accordingly. So this will be useful for uh, embodied simulations. And in particular, uh, this, the Kate and, and David are in astrophysics. So the goal that, that we are looking into is cosmological simulations. Um, and, and so the groups that we are taking into consideration here are like the classical groups, orthogonal group, rotations, which are SOD, uh, translations, and then the Euclidean group that considers translations and rotations. Uh, the Lorentz group, which is the group that comes from special relativity, which basically is like uh, the orthogonal group, but you have a different transformation in the, in the time space. And the Poincaré group that does Lorentz transformations and, and, tra and translations, and, and also we, uh, we look to parameterize permutation invariant functions. So meaning that if I change the ordering of the inputs, the function doesn't change. So for instance, if you're doing particle simulations, then you don't care what order of the particles you give to your system. And then the, the, act, the groups act as you expect on your vector. So the rotations are by the multiplication, the translations, so the translations, we're going to think that only act on some position vectors and don't act on other vectors like velocities. And, um, and that's it. And so for instance, one example of, a, a transla of an invariant function is the total mechanical energy of the system. That's something that you can write in this form for like masses, positions, and velocity. You can write it in, in this way. And, and basically, this total mechanical energy, as you may imagine, is invariant with respect to uh, the translations and permit permutations of the particles and rotations. And basically, um, uh, is, this is what in physics is called like a scalar function. It needs to have these properties in order for, for them to consider it to be scalar. Anyway, so we are not going to consider other actions by groups that are interesting uh, for, for machine learning. So for instance, one of the typical groups that what people care about is the, is, the, is the permutation group acting by conjugation. So in graph neural networks, so say you're given a, a graph by, uh, by its adjacency matrix and you wanna find an embedding of the graph. And so what you want is that if you relabel the nodes, then the, the embedding relabels accordingly. So that is saying that uh, if I act by this group of permutations by conjugation, then the, in the output, it, it uh, permutes accordingly. So that's like the relabeling of the, of the node equal to, to that. Uh, we're not going to parameterize uh, these, these actions, but I'm gonna explain you how people do it in general. And basically what we propose is a different approach that may be simpler uh, and 
um, maybe more expressive. Uh, so the classical approach that people use to parameterize invariant functions uh, and to design neural network architectures, depending on, on different groups, are um, given, for instance, by the paper of Risi Condor in 2018 called Embody Networks, where they basically propose uh, an, a way of parameterizing these functions based on irreducible representations. And there's also some, some work by Maron and collaborators, and they have several papers on the design of in, invariant and equivariant networks. So the idea is the following. Uh, one, one approach that, that they propose is based on uh, what it would be like a generalization of a field forward neural network. So we have an input that is a vector, and then we're going to apply a linear map that is going to be equivariant, and then a nonlinear activation function that needs to be consistent with the action of the group, and then a, another linear function, etc. So the linear functions that we are going to apply at each layer, in the case of, of these architectures, what they propose is that they're actually going to take uh, a tensor uh, where you uh, act by the group in each of the dimensions of the tensor, like as a, uh, as a tensor action, right? Like if you have a tensor like this, then you will apply the transformation in each of the dimensions of the tension in the tensor in the same way. And so this and this is going to be linear and equivariant. That's that's the approach. The, so linear and equivalent, but extended to tensor. So basically, it's kind of like thinking of what the polynomial functions would look like in a way. Um, and this um, and so the approach that people use is based on irreducible representation. So basically, if the group is G, they consider rho uh, uh, a representation of the group. And then they observe that having a linear equivalent map between these two spaces is equivalent to having a map between two groups of representations in the way it, in this way. Basically, that uh, the, the linear map composed with the uh, representation of, of the group of the group uh, object uh, is is equal to the composition of that with the linear map. So, so then once that we understand that uh, understanding the linear equivariant maps is the same as understanding the maps between the representations, then what they do is they parameterize the maps between the representations using the rules of representations because that's easy to do in, in the case in the case that if you have um, um, a map between two irreducible representations, is either the identity or zero, or like a multiple of the identity or zero. So basically, if you can take your, your um, say, say you want to find a basis to express all the linear equivalent maps uh, that, that um, for, for a group action, then what you can do is take the group, look at the irreducible representations of that group, and then parameterize uh, your all your linear equivalent functions in terms of the of of these uh, irreducible representations so in order to do that then you will need to given a, a representation you will need to be able to express it in as a like with the these building blocks of irreducible representations and typically in in, in our case this this um, this representation that we have is a it has the form of a uh, of a tensor of, of, uh, of a representation just because of the form of the linear maps that I gave you. And this identification here is typically in this in these neural network arch architectures given by these uh, cleft gordon coefficients. Like the, there is a way to decompose this product representation in irreducibles for some groups using these cleft gordon uh, coefficients, which are known for SO3 but are not known nor implemented for groups of uh, the greater or equal uh, than five, for instance. Um, so for instance, this approach uh, has very nice mathematical properties and has been implemented. There's some papers that actually implement this approach. And there is, a, for instance, a paper by Dean and Maron in 2021 that proved that this approach universally approximate all, all SO3 equivariant functions. Um, 
So other approaches, this is not the only approach to, to produce a, a invariant functions. There, there's a, a paper by, oh, well, and there's a line of work by Taco Cohen where they uh, propose other ways of, of uh, designing equivalent convolutions. And the, there is this paper by Mark Finzi, also at NYU, and, and Andrew Gordon Wilson, where they show how to express equivalence, uh, equivalent maps by giving a set of constraints. So you can look at all the maps satisfying the constraints that the equivalence constraints give you, basically. And they have a library that implements this, and it's very nice. Uh, so our approach is going to be much simpler. and, and and a little bit, and it will work for, for any dimension. So, and this is, is like very simple mathematical property that is known from like the, from the 1900s, which is a, the characterization of invariant functions. So the idea is that if you have an invariant function um, of n vectors in RV, this is a, a function is invariant if and only if you, it's a function of the inner products of the inputs. That is like the first fundamental theorem for, 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 for all the. And this is also true for other groups. So for instance, for the Lorentz group, uh, this, this characterization is true, but then it wouldn't be for the, for the typical inner product, but for the Lorentz inner product, which is this one, which is not really an inner product, but it works like an inner product because it's not positive definite, but anyway. Um, so the proof of this is very simple. Basically, if you have your vectors, you can construct the function, the matrix M, which is the outer, uh, outer product or like the inner product matrix between the columns of B and, and, and B, just the inner products. And then if you have the matrix of inner products, then you can do the, the, the Cholesky decomposition and this decomposition is unique up to orthogonal matrices. And so therefore, if you're given the inner products, then you can recover the vectors up to the orthogonal matrices, uh, which is basically the orbit of the group that you're acting by. So that's, that's what you're doing. So in the case when you're looking at SOD, this characterization has a, more, a, a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because of like something that I may mention a little bit uh, later, but it has more or less the same form, but it's a little bit more complicated. So in physics point of view, this basically says that all is this is equivalent to say that all scalars can be written in nice and summation notation. So it's just like taking inner products of things. And um, one may say, okay, but you're taking a function that had like n n d vectors, and now you're giving me that is a function of like n square uh, inner products. So um, like if you're going to use these two parameterized functions then you are being very inefficient. And what I claim is that you can use the low rank, low rank matrix completion theory or like literature to design some subspace of, um, of inner products or subs, uh, like, um, like subsets of inner products that allow you to reconstruct the, the function from like the entire, you can reconstruct all the inner products by just a subset. So basically you can say it's a, sub, it's a function of a subset of the inner products and not all the inner products. And then this, the design of this sampling procedure is something that I'm interested in and like how it would work in practice, say it's restricted, restricting this matrix to a subset of inner products. Okay, so that's for invariant functions and I said nothing new. But, uh, but now we're going to go into like equivariant functions, which is the ones that we care about in, in, in practice. So, um, so something that is a, a quite simple of observation is that if we, are if, you, if we look at all equivariant functions that are vector functions, this can be parametrized as a linear combination of your inputs uh, times where the coefficient functions are all the invariant functions. So basically functions of inner products. The, the proof of this is actually very simple. And so then this tells you that, uh, that just you only, you can write, yeah, you can write your, your equivalent function as a linear combination of your inputs where each of the coefficient functions are an invariant scalar function. And actually we can prove that if this function is a polynomial, then these coefficients can be chosen to be polynomials, though we don't have a bound on the degree. 
uh, of what of what these polynomials need to be. And um, but maybe that's something simple that I, I, I didn't I didn't figure out. But also we, we have examples where this function is continuous and we cannot choose these coefficient functions to be continuous. So there may be some something, yeah, some something not that nice going on. But this this parametrization works in any dimension and we hope that this is going to be some some way to parameterize uh, invariant functions that you, is useful for physics and does not require you to know the irreducible representations. And so extending to the Euclidean group, so translation invariance is, is, is trivial because it's just saying that if you, if you have a function that is translation invariant of some vector inputs, you can think of them as like a function of the differences of, of the inputs, right? So, so for instance, you is a function of the each of the vectors minus the center of mass, for instance, or like the vectors minus the first vector or something like that. Uh, so uh, including that is very easy. And then the next point is uh, how do you characterize permutation invariance in this setting? So we know that um, if uh, if you have H uh, a permutation like a uh, all the invariant function, we can use the formulation that we have from the previous slide. And, and, and then, ah, I'm, I forgot to show you something from the previous slide that it was under the fold. Sorry. Okay. So we have an example for this that I think is, is useful for physics. And I think it gives you like a, a nice perspective of what's going on. Uh, and how, how long am I going? Am I out of time? Almost. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in two minutes. minutes. So basically, the idea is that using the the the, the fact that the cross product you can so the cross product is a, is a is a is an example of a function that is not uh, is is something that you don't imagine that you can write as a linear combination of the inputs, right? I mean, it's something that that is not actually the cross product is equivariant, SOD equivariant. It, it, uh, but well, say SO3, if, if we have the two vectors in R3, the, the cross product is, is SO3 equivariant, but it's not a linear com combination of the inputs. So that's where the difference with SO3 lies. And, and so you imagine that if you write the electromagnetic uh, force law in this form, then, then uh, this, uh, you you may, may may imagine that you cannot you are not able to write the linear combination of the inputs, but actually there is like if you if you rewrite this tensor product as like this uh like in in this form, then you can rewrite everything and see that actually the electromagnetic force can be written as a linear combination of the inputs, where the linear combination functions are a little bit more annoying in the sense that in this expression over here, you can factor out your test particle, like it is kind of like a mean, uh, like a field formulation. And in this formulation, you don't have a field formulation anymore. You cannot factor out the test particle. So it may be that actually the formulation, the, this formulation is not that, I mean, it has disadvantages, that's the point. And then finally for permutation invariance, I wanted to say that, um, we can choose that all the functions, the coefficient uh, functions are the same. And they will take the, when they multiply, uh, when our coefficient of the vector bi, then, then it's, a, the fun, it's a function of bi and everything else where is permutation invariant with respect to the last inputs. And these things are easy to implement using message passing neural networks because of like the way they are structured. I don't have any numerics to show you at this time, but I'm just going to tell you that uh, the summary is that we provide a simple characterization of equivalent functions that uh, are based on Einstein summation notation and classical invariant theory. And the goal is to design expressive graph neural network architectures to address machine learning problems while avoiding the, the use of irreducible representations that are not always known how to implement. And we have a couple of open problems regarding incorporating multi-scale information and designing a, a subset of permutation invariant scalars that, so the scalars that we are using are not permutation invariant, if you remember in this, in this formulation that we have here, but maybe we can also 
use some formation variance scalars that are universally expressive. Thank you so much, and I apologize if I went over.